I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank because it's beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Magnificast, the podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Dean Detloff. And I'm your other co-host, Matt Bernico. Matt, uh, what's going on over there in Scotland, in one of the several British Isles, as I understand it? Yeah, there's a few of them, these British Isles. <laughs> as you, so there's some that are really small, even. You wouldn't even believe it. Uh, you can't even see them on a map. They're so tiny. Um, well, let's see. What's going on here? I went to the Whiskey Festival with a friend of the show, William Gibson, uh, we had some whiskeys, probably too many, but <laughs> some might say not enough. Um, <laughs> differing opinions maybe on how much we had. It was great, though. I got to try some really fancy bottles of whiskey. What an experience. A true Scottish experience, if you ask me. Yeah, I did. Thanks. I appreciate it. Dean, what have you been up to? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. While you were sitting at the whiskey festival having all your... No, they're all holy. They're all oh, okay. No, they're ho- they're holy drinks. I had okay. Fair enough. All right. Uh, well, um, I was definitely comparatively holier because I did go to a retreat led by the Dominicans in Toronto. Oh, dang. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I spent several hours listening to these Dominicans, um, and uh, it was great. The Dominicans are cool. Mendicans are cool. And uh, it was really fun. I was learning about this guy Pierre Clavery, a really fascinating Dominican bishop in Algeria. Who, if you've never heard about, you should definitely read his Wikipedia and whatever. Interesting guy. But, you know, what was very funny is Matt and I are talking about St. Francis all the time. We're still going to do it today in this episode, but we'll say more about that in a minute. And it was very funny to be in this house full of Dominicans because St. Dominic and St. Francis, you know, they're kind of like buddies. The orders are sort of close together and uh, but also extremely different. And I feel like the lay Dominicans are like slowly trying to persuade me to be one of them instead of a Franciscan. And I got to say, they make a compelling case. Uh, They definitely have given me more more quiche than the Franciscans ever have. And I got to hand that to them. (laughs) You're a real free agent in the world of lay (laughs) religious orders. You could go either way. I wonder who's going to give you the best offer. Can't wait to see. Yeah, it's hard to say, you know, confirmation's not enough. I just got to keep making vows. Can't stop. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's good. (laughs) I guess that's good. It's it's something. (laughs) Dean, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the Pope lately uh, because we're reading a book about Pope Francis and St. Francis. Uh, We'll we'll get there in a minute. Well, no, I'll I'll say more about it right now because this wouldn't make sense (laughs) unless I did. So read this book. Uh, this week we're talking about this book. It's called Francis of Rome, Francis of Sisi. It's by Leonardo Boff, everyone's fave Brazilian liberation theologian. Um, it's a really interesting book for a lot of different reasons. Um, maybe the first big reason. Okay, this is how I found the book very interesting. And I'm sure there are some other things that we can say about why it's interesting. But uh, Pope Francis, he became the Pope, you might recall, in 2013. And this book came out in 2014. And within it, Leonardo Boff is making some comparisons between Pope Francis and uh, and St. Francis. But he makes some really big, like, half-court called shots um, at, like, <laughs> what Pope Francis is going to do and, like, how he's going to kind of inherit that title of St. Francis. And that's really interesting. Um, I thought, wow, what a weird thing that, that popes do this. They take on someone else's name. Um, Dean, I was wondering, what if you're a pope, whose who's name would you be? Would you be? Who's, whose would you take? Which one would you grab from the big basket of history to be the Pope? 
Man, that is tough. I'm surprised that in all of my years of existence, nobody has ever asked me that question. What a good Catholic icebreaker. I'm going to yeah. steal that one for sure. That's my next one. Put it in your back pocket. Uh huh. Man, uh, I got to think about it for a while, but... Uh, we can come back I mean, to it. You don't have to answer now. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'll come back to it. Do you have one? Are you asking because you have one that actually you're, you're really settled <laughs> on already? No, I was actually thinking... I hope you don't turn this question on me. Um, but here's the good thing <laughs> is uh, being Episcopalian, I don't have to think about this question uh, because it would never happen to me. So it's fine. <laughs> don't uh, if you if you're confirmed in the Episcopal Church, though, don't you also take like a saintly name in the way that like Catholics do when they get confirmed? To? Oh, that's true. I think some people do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would be Pope John Shelby Spong. I think that's what I would do. <laughs> I would make uh, everybody yeah. mad. Not That's just the right. Catholics, but also the Episcopalians <laughs> and definitely the rest of Protestants. They would hate that. So <laughs> Universally hated by all. Uh, well, let's talk, about, <laughs> let's talk about this Pope who's still around for now. Uh, like Matt said, this book came out in 2014. And we were reading it because we're reading all this St. Francis stuff as we're writing this weird book. And uh, it's especially interesting to read now because it's 2024. So it's been 10 years since the book was written. And Pope Francis has been the Pope for a while now. And uh, it's, I think, a neat thing to look at in retrospect, both because, as you said, Matt, there's a lot of really fascinating called shots from Leonardo Boff uh, in the book. So having a decade to kind of see how that parsed out is pretty neat. Um, But it's also interesting because I think there is sort of a a live question about what is Pope Francis's legacy going to be? What does it mean to take the name of Francis of Assisi as the Pope which is, as uh, Leonardo Boff explains, kind of a contradiction in terms, or you would think that it would be a contradiction in terms. And maybe the the big immediate uh, take here is that Leonardo Boff thinks that Pope Francis, or uh, Father Bergoglio previously, is the uh, probably like the one person who could pull it off. He could be St. Francis as the Pope. He could take on Francis's name as the Pope. And he he trusts that he's going to be able to to do a good job with it, which I think is pretty interesting. And for people who don't know, also, uh, Leonardo Boff himself was a Franciscan priest and still is like a Francis inspired guy. He left the priesthood after a while, but he was you know part of a Franciscan community for many years, even when he was writing liberation theology. So pretty high praise, I feel like, to earn that from someone like Boff. So we're going to talk about the book a little bit. We're going to talk about Pope Francis, we're going to talk about St. Francis, and we're going to talk about Leonardo Boff, three of your favorite Catholic guys in your trading card collection, <laughs> and uh, we'll give you some more rookie stats. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think that it might be good to draw that distinction about why why a Pope Francis seems like a contradiction in terms, maybe at the top here. Um, you know, to be called Pope Francis draws out, like, I think, two different types of images and pushes them together in ways that you wouldn't expect. Like, I don't know. Think of a pope. Think of a pope who isn't Pope Francis. <laughs> and uh, what you'll think of is uh, John Paul II's fancy shoes. Uh, <laughs> the, my favorite punk did, band. <laughs> oh, my God. He had, like, wild designer shoes, though, didn't he? Is, is that a thing that I'm making up or is that true? That was uh, a Benedict true? had the wild shoes. The oh, red shoes. shoot. Okay, well, one of them had wild shoes. It was Pope Benedict, fine. <laughs> you think of his fancy shoes. You think of the big Vatican castles. You think of, like, uh, I don't know, designer-made um, stoles and, um, you know, different types of weird vestments. All kinds of, like, monarchical sort of, like, authoritarian, extremely bourgeois things, right? The kinds of things that Marxists do love to hate with, with good reason, Um, so that's Pope's on one hand. And then Francis on the other hand is a guy who upon like pledging himself to living a spiritual life, he took all of his clothes off and went to live in the woods. (laughs) So a pretty stark contrast if you think about it for more than two seconds. So, uh, but, but to have a, have somebody kind of putting these two things together is like, uh, you know, complicated. It's, uh, it's things that shouldn't go together. You know, it's, uh, somebody choosing a life of poverty versus like somebody having like, you know, the height of luxury. Um, so in Leonardo Boff's book, Francis of Rome, Francis of Assisi, he draws out like what it means for Pope Francis to have the name Francis and like what that might signal for the church overall and like what kind of moves he might be making. Again, this is 2014, um, just a year into Pope Francis's, uh, 
papal stay. I don't know what the word is. His reign. <laughs> his his reign <laughs> over the Vatican. Yeah, papacy. I guess the correct word. Sure, fine. Um, we'll get. To you can the, use papal stay. Okay, I'll say papal stay from now on. Um, we'll get to all the specifics about like what those things actually were in a minute. But Boff sees Pope Francis as like a reformer of Catholicism, which I think is not wrong. Um, some 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 might say not reformer enough. Um, some might say reformer too much, but re- reformer nonetheless. <laughs> but there's a lot of really interesting things that comes out of that come out of Boff's book. Um, but it's also, uh, I think, a really timely thing to revisit, uh, not just because Pope Francis is the Pope still, but because uh, there's been a bunch of recent news on reforms to the dicastery of the Doctrine of the Faith, which was the office of the Vatican that uh, uh, Ratzinger, uh, the, the former Pope, but before he was Pope, <laughs> led and used to discipline liberation theologians. And uh, it's also maybe more significantly the part of the church that formerly led the Inquisition, which is... <laughs> not great so anyways a reform of that whole kind of um that whole like organ of the church which is quite interesting that's actually one of the big called shots in the book that uh boff makes he thinks that uh he has a whole section called can the curia be reformed and uh we've we've now seen it it's it's happening it's actively going on uh dean do you want to talk about that bit a little bit Yeah, sure. I mean, it is a really fun thing. If you want to be a nerd about bureaucracy and structure and all the kind of nuts and bolts of church life, reading about the Curia is actually pretty fun and interesting. It's one of those things that I feel like every once in a while I get an urge to just know everything about and then immediately forget (laughs) like a week later because when are you ever going to use that knowledge? And so whenever it comes up in the news, it's always fun to go back and be like, what is going on here? Um, The Curia is kind of the fancy term for the, for lack of a better word, the apparatus around the Pope, Uh, the political, theological, legal apparatus around the Pope. It's kind of like, I don't know, people draw a lot of analogies and they all kind of work like up to a point and they're not quite right. For example, like some people say it's the Pope's cabinet, but that's not exactly right because it's not just politics. You know, they do theology stuff, uh, they are maybe not as like interchangeable uh, of offices as some cabinet offices might be in different parliamentary systems. Um, Some people compare it to like a council, but it's not exactly that either. Like it's a lot of administrators and people doing bureaucratic work as well. So the best term, as weird as it is, I think is still an apparatus. It's a big apparatus of people and offices around the Pope. And when John Paul II was the Pope, he famously built up a curia that many critics of the Vatican, including Leonardo Boff, had said was kind of a return to a more medieval uh, style of the papacy and of the Vatican, where the Pope is a bit of a monarch and, you know, all the bishops are the princes of the church and they end up kind of having this uh, courtly apparatus. And Benedict, too, was very interested in that model of the Curia. So Pope Francis has uh, been slowly reforming the Curia in many different ways. Some offices have had maybe like more dramatic change than others, but he has been definitely tinkering with the the big apparatus around uh, himself in some pretty interesting ways. So there are some that have gotten more or less press. Uh, the one that got a lot a while back was the so he first of all, I guess I should say he changed the title of many of these offices from congregations to dicastery. And to be honest, I don't really know what the substance of that change is. I've tried to figure it out, tried to understand it. I've never found anything super convincing about the substantialness of it, but it is basically, a, I think, a bit of a branding move. And so he had established this office called the Dicastery for Integral Human Development. It is the dicastery that is really involved in a lot of social justice stuff. It works on issues of migration. It works on international issues and a lot of solidarity stuff. So I think about it a lot and read about what's coming out of it a lot. Um, It's a very interesting dicastery. So that's, for example, something that Pope Francis is up to. Uh, The one that has been getting the most press lately is, as Matt mentioned, the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith, which used, used, used to be the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. And uh, it was previously a kind of um, investigating uh, apparatus or investigatory office. So you might think of when Ratzinger was the head of it, he earned the nickname, maybe rightly or wrongly, of God's Rottweiler, that he was kind of running around pursuing people and 
getting people in trouble and taking them to theology court. And uh, it was kind of a, a detective agency for heresy, basically. Uh, Pope Francis changed that. And in fact, even in his announcement about changing it, he said that previously this office had been known for for doing just that, for kind of sniffing out problems and creating even a, an atmosphere of fear or paranoia. Instead, he said it should actually be an office dedicated to evangelization, which is a pretty big difference, and that it should be invitational. It shouldn't be kind of looking for problems. And the person that he uh, appointed to it also could not be more different from um, from Benedict. His name is Victor Manuel Fernandez. He is also from Argentina, just like Pope Francis. And you've probably been seeing him in the news. He's gotten a lot of press for... I don't know, weird books he wrote about kissing or something <laughs> a long time ago. Oh, it's that guy, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's that guy, exactly. Um, but uh, somebody who's very different than Ratzinger was as the head of that office, and it kind of gives a sense of maybe the the flavor of, of how Pope Francis is changing the Curia. Um, it fits along with all the other stuff you've probably heard about the church in the last few years, this approach of synodality, which means walking together, you really get the sense that for Pope Francis, the Curia, if it's going to be useful at all, it has to be something that facilitates greater outreach and also greater kind of dialogue or chances for encounter, as opposed to the previous iterations of the Curia, which you can kind of intuit are the opposite of that, that they maybe create some barriers or walls between the, the papacy and the Vatican and the rest of the world or kind of what's going on out in the world, a bit more defensive in a posture as opposed to Pope Francis's dicasteries, which are more kind of creative or proactive or kind of protagonistic, to use a big Pope Francis word. So all that to say, uh, the Curie is going through some big changes, and I think it's actually an open question to be like, will these changes outlive Pope Francis? When Pope Francis dies, are these reforms going to survive in the way that they sort of survived between JP2 and Benedict? Or are we going to get another Pope who reforms the Curia again? So uh, it's interesting that Leonardo Boff is like, I think Pope Francis is going to do this, which I think in 2014 would actually be a pretty big ask. And Boff himself had been, you know, a victim of that uh, that previous curia. He had suffered a lot as a result of it. He was silenced for a whole year as a result of an investigation from the, the CDF. Uh, and so for him to already be coming out the gates being like, I think this is going to happen and for it to actually happen, I think is also kind of an interesting testament to maybe Boff's unique position to see the shared spirit between St. Francis and Pope Francis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's extremely helpful context. I think I've been, I've been reading a few articles about it, but my non-Catholic brain is having a hard time wrapping uh, itself around it. You know, there's a, a lot of emphasis in this book from Boff about the, I don't want to say like archaic, but archaic forms of the Catholic church and how they are. I think like, maybe unhelpful for people encountering the church in the world in, <laughs> in 2024. Um, there's a, there's a section that I thought was really interesting that I don't know if it's like, like, listen, Boff is a scholar. He knows probably he, he knows about these things more than I do. So I guess I should just trust him, but he has this like kind of um, these sets of like conspiracy theories about how the Pope comes to be the Pope in the first place. And it's like, <laughs> through this kind of elaborate set of like forged documents um, here. Actually, let me just read this bit here. Cause it is kind of funny. Well, funny in like <laughs> a, a sort of dark way. So he's, he's talking about how, how does Pope Leo the first, how he, he becomes like the Supreme Pontiff, like the, the Pope who's like got absolute power and uh, over Catholicism. So he says it all starts though with it's a letter from Pope Clement to James. You, you might know him also as the brother of Jesus. Um, and in the letter uh, that, uh, that, supposedly was written but is a, apparently according to boff forged um that peter had determined that clement should be his single legitimate successor and of course those who came after him um and then there's even a, f a few other forgeries of letters from uh the emperor constantine and so on that kind of like establishes um the pope as like the supreme leader of the church and also kind of like the leader of a of, of the empire which is such an interesting thing but anyways it's interesting that boff frames it in this particular way i mean historically accurate or not that's like the sort of like um these people who are grabbing for power right that have created this big lumbering <laughs> bureaucracy and also kind of weird monarchy monarchy um and uh he sees pope francis uh as 
the person who's going to like probably not undo it, but set things right. Um, I don't know, Dean, what do you think? What did you think of that, that bit? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you're at liberty to say as a Catholic, maybe you'll, you'll get taken to the theology court by the, uh, the theology detectives, but uh, what's your take? Yeah. Uh, I really don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've read a handful of histories of uh, the Catholic church and the papacy, and there's all kinds of opinions about this moment specifically. There's, a, there's like a series of greatest hits moments in the Catholic church of like historical, I don't know, issues or, or things people have to talk about, like the emergence of the papacy is one. Um, having a bunch of popes fight each other is another one. Like at one time we had three popes running around or three people who said they're the pope anyway. Uh, the kind of advent of uh, papal infallibility in the 1800s. That's another big moment, right? So lots of big moments, I guess. And this is usually one. I guess what I find interesting about it, whether one makes anything of the veracity of of those kinds of theories or not, which are not like, I don't know, they're not completely absurd. Uh, but what I find interesting is that when Boff is kind of invoking them, on the one hand, he's like historicizing the papacy in this really interesting way. And you might even get the impression that he's like, popes are bad, I don't like them, because this is sort of a, I don't know, based on a deception or a betrayal or a lie. But the entire book is him being like, Pope Francis is awesome. I think he's a great pope. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting tensions there. And it's something I find both, like, interesting and always kind of wrestle with with Leonardo Boff. His brother, Clodovis Boff, as we've talked about on this podcast before, who's also a priest and used to be a liberation theologian, he is a person who uses a lot of distinctions, a lot of analysis. Like, he likes to have bulleted lists of points. He's he's a systematic thinker. Leonardo Boff, I guess also in true St. Francis fashion, is like pure vibes. Yeah, <laughs> like you never vibes really based. know. You never really know what's true or not. But uh, the point is to kind of get a feel for it. So I think that's the best way to read it is like, what's the feeling of Leonardo Boff kind of being mad about that? And I think that it comes down to uh, this profound sense that the Catholic Church does get alienated from the sources that give rise to Christianity, you know, like the simplicity of Jesus meeting a bunch of people and proclaiming liberation to the oppressed. For Boff, the church is always at risk of kind of being, yeah, further and further away from that kind of founding moment. And St. Francis, as a reformer himself, is always trying to call the church back to that moment. And I think Francis, uh, Pope Francis, for Boff, is also trying to repeat that moment to kind of call the church back to fidelity to that you know, more communitarian vision of Christianity. So that's how I read it. Whether or not it's true, I don't know. I'm using some great politician um, <laughs> strategies here to like not really answer the question. But, you know, uh, if you're listening, Theology FBI, you can uh, you can wait for the next pope and then maybe I'll have a different opinion. To push that point a bit further, I mean, Boff is is ex writing the exact narrative that you're outlining here, right? That um, there is a way that the Catholic Church has been alienated from the people or has alienated itself from the people. However you want to like formulate that is fine. I guess uh, he says uh, Boff in his book says people who are sons and daughters of our time cannot be evangelized by presenting them with a model of the church as a bastion of conservatism and authoritarianism, a church that sees itself as a fortress besieged by, by modernity that it holds responsible for relativism of every sort. And then he goes on to say a few minutes later, the, ch the church can be saved as long as it is inspired by the tradition of Jesus, returns to drink from the well of the gospel, sets out to serve the world rather than itself, and puts the poor at the center in a quest for liberation and social justice. Um, I think that these two parts, this, so these two are uh, from the earlier parts of Boff's book, where he's kind of trying to explain like the significance of the alienation of the church and then also like you know what would it mean for the church to come back around or something or what would it look like um but you you get that kind of feeling right that the there's there's a certain a straight not maybe not a strainness that's not the right kind of word but um that the church has not done itself any favors with like the authoritarianism of its structures and maybe it's the inflexibility that it brings with it um but that's when uh that's when Pope Francis kind of comes on the scene and he says uh, this next. Why did Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio choose the name Francis? It was for exactly the same reason that made the young man recently converted to the gospel, Francis of Assisi, become the pioneer of a movement to restore the medieval church. Francis is not only a name, it's a project to create a church that's poor, simple, evangelical, and stripped of all trappings. 
Francis began a church that walked the roads together with the lowly. He created the first communities of brothers who prayed the breviary under the trees with birds. It was an ecological church that called all creatures by the beautiful name of brothers and sisters. Um, so this is, uh, I think, actually a really cool way of thinking. Uh, St. Francis as a guy, as a historical figure, a person that existed, <laughs> is not, I would, I would not say that he's a complicated figure. I think he's actually a pretty simple guy. <laughs> Maybe unsurprising, um, but uh, just the same. Uh, I like the idea that Francis isn't a name. It's like a particular type of project. And I think that is actually really true. Um, it's a it's a type of thing that, ex- that, that outlived Francis himself. It's a thing that, I mean, even within his, his lifetime, it outlived him. <laughs> Francis was, all, like, was trying to figure out what to do with all these followers, basically, in his life, and uh, could never quite sort it out himself. And the the church at the time had to kind of step in and do it for him, which um, I don't know is sometimes good, sometimes bad, who knows? But anyways, uh, I think this is an interesting way of thinking about uh, what it means to be Pope Francis um, is kind of inheriting that tradition of uh, not a name, but like a particular project, an idea of church that is uh, different than the hierarchical sort of like uh, monarchical ways of, church that uh, have existed within Catholicism forever. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it is a suggestive analogy, St. Francis and Pope Francis. You know, it's one that Pope Francis makes himself. So I think we're encouraged, I guess, to find those kind of commonalities and and see what's going on there. Uh, Matt and I have been reading so many books about St. Francis lately and just trying to learn about, I don't know, what's going on in the 13th century. And it was a wild place, (laughs) incredibly weird situation all around. Um, but even within that weirdness, uh, that's something that's so fascinating about St. Francis is that he's trying to do something that's actually kind of basic and it's the basicness of it that makes it so bizarre, you know, a life of total poverty, um, a life of just trying to repeat the, the life of Jesus in, you know, medieval Italy or whatever. And, uh, what I find so fascinating about it is around the time of Francis's experiments that kind of led to him being a saint. There were all kinds of other uh, weird kind of Christian or semi-Christian or eventually heretical movements of renewal and apocalyptic movements and people just running around thinking like another world is possible. And some of them end up falling out of favor with the church. Some of them are incorporated into the church. And St. Francis is one of those who does get incorporated in with all the contradictions that that entails. And I feel like it's actually very similar with Pope Francis. And to have Leonardo Boff write this book. Uh, really kind of brought that home more to me this time around that right before Pope Francis becomes the Pope in the last, you know, 50 or 60 years prior to that, you really get this uh, kind of similar sense. There's a lot of other reformers running around, a lot of other theologians trying to say something about the church. And Pope Francis becomes uh, a bit of a reformer who is, you know, also part of the apparatus, uh, the top of the apparatus even, And there's a lot of contradictions that that brings along as well. And I think it's been interesting to see how Pope Francis is kind of um, tacitly endorsing and sometimes explicitly endorsing or rehabilitating some of those figures that the previous papacies had pushed out. You know, some of the people we really like, like Ernesto Cardinal or, uh, I don't know, just a handful of liberation theologians, including Leonardo Boff. Um, You know, Francis has gone out of his way to celebrate mass with them, to bring them back into the fold of the church, to lift their suspensions and so on. And uh, you really do get this kind of analogous situation where the world is very complicated. The church is also very complicated, but there is a kind of simplicity to both Pope Francis and St. Francis in ways that I think are both like really cool and sometimes kind of naive. (laughs) That's all, all part of it, I guess. It wouldn't be Franciscan if it wasn't kind of naive. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Yeah, well, speaking of some of that naivete, but also the complexities of it, um, maybe we could talk about this other theme I really liked in the book, which is kind of a through line um, about colonial Christianity and Eurocentrism. uh, And it's interesting to see Boff kind of pull the Pope into this conversation. So uh, Leonardo Boff says this, the reformer, that is Pope Francis, had to come from abroad, from the periphery, from the influences of the millennial ecclesiastical status quo. Pope Francis came from the South, not from any Episcopal seat famous for its history. He's a son of colonial Christianity, which was always dependent on the great metropolitan and ecclesiastical centers. Over the course of 500 years, this colonial Christianity has become rooted in our mestizo cultures, 
It has acquired a new face and engendered a surprising vitality and originality. And I think this is actually a really fascinating bit of the book, that Pope Francis is a reformer not only in the spirit of St. Francis from Italy, but he's also a reformer who comes from a very different part of the world. Or uh, as Pope Francis said right when he became the pope, that uh, they had to go to the ends of the earth to find the next pope um, to Argentina. And I think it's a a really interesting point and one that is full of a lot of, um, at least for me anyway, a lot of complicated feelings. I do think Pope Francis is definitely challenging the coloniality of the Catholic Church. He makes a lot of gestures toward it uh, that are not meaningless. You know, in the Amazon Synod, when that happened, Pope Francis took a lot of flack for embracing even indigenous depictions of uh, Mother Earth and so on. He's incorporated a lot of that rhetoric into his own writing and ministry. Um, At the same time, you can kind of see him struggle to fully understand even or fully reckon with uh, colonialism. I mean, we really saw that, I think, here in Canada in a big way. So that's kind of at the front of my brain. But you see it, too, in his writings about the Amazon or even in some of his encyclicals. It's like, on the one hand, he will denounce that the church uh, contributed to colonialism and even has colonial vestiges inside of it that he says we got to think about and get rid of. But on the other hand, he often still projects a certain kind of, you know, Christian supremacist or completionist narrative, um, sometimes contradicts that elsewhere. So all that to say, it's kind of, uh, it's neat for Boff to pull that part out. And then also um, a strange thing to see over the last 10 years, how Pope Francis has really wrestled to, uh, (laughs) to deal with the coloniality of the church and maybe of his own kind of position within the church as the Pope uh, over a decade. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That's so interesting. Um, Dean, can you talk about some of the times? Sorry, this is putting you on the spot because this is not in our notes. But can you can you maybe can you point to some of the tensions where Pope Francis has been like, OK, saying that he's like a decolonial pope is like a little too much. I think uh, it's true that he comes from Latin America, but there's also a lot of ways that he is like really complicit in European Christianity. Like you, you mentioned, like, like the sort of completionist narratives. Could you talk about that part a bit more? Because I feel like I don't know as much about that. Yeah, I mean, you see, for example, in the Amazon Synod documents, um, this is some weird <laughs> Catholic nerd stuff, but uh, so when they do a big synod, usually there's like a preparatory report that's made by the bishops of the synod. Um, in the most recent synod, it's more complicated, but previously it's usually the bishops. Uh, and there's input from lots of other people too, but it becomes a, a report of the bishops. And then after that, uh, and after a whole process of dialogue and conversation, the Pope then writes what becomes a kind of exhortation or some kind of statement or whatever that comes out of the synodal process and is kind of a definitive document in some ways. Uh, So in the the Amazon Synod, the definitive document was called Carita Amazonia. And the bishop's document ahead of it is really fascinating and kind of seeing like where the... uh, where the continuities and discontinuities are is a really interesting exercise. If you have a weekend and you want to do something really weird, um, it's a, an interesting exercise. So like, for example, in the Bishop's document, they spend a lot more time talking about the colonialism of the church. And they even have this uh, rallying cry to um, basically root out the remaining colonialism that's in the Catholic church. Um, they also talk a little bit more about indigenous spiritualities sort of on their own terms in ways that are really interesting. Uh, when you get Carita Amazonia and Pope Francis's attempt to synthesize, um, a lot of that does come through, but it is definitely muted from the bishop's document. Uh, and you also get a sense that, again, that kind of Christian completionist bit is indigenous spiritualities are so important, they're great, but ultimately they kind of tell us something about Christianity or they sort of need to be completed by Christianity. And one mm-hmm. of the the great tragedies of colonialism is that it prevented people from kind of, you know, seeing Christianity or Christ as the final culmination of their, the spirituality that they had been seeking. So there's a, you know, it, I mean, it's just standard Christian stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is how Christians think. <laughs> but, and it's unsurprising for the Pope to say that, I guess. But it is really instructive. And uh, I think it, it came to a head even more here in Canada where, you know, the demand was really to have the church own its role as a colonial force, um, which is something that Pope Francis has said elsewhere. Like he was stronger in Bolivia on this topic uh, when he visited Bolivia. But when he did come to Canada, he really um, 
repeated a lot of rhetoric from that we'd already seen from the Canadian bishops, which was to sort of create some distance between the Catholic Church and the colonial project of Canada, even while affirming that, yes, there were Catholics involved and, you know, they have responsibility. The church itself is something that he kind of avoided taking on in a bigger way. So, yeah, there's lots of subtleties there. I think there's lots of politics, too, but all that to say, like, Leonardo Boff, you know, he, uh, what I love about him is that he lets himself get carried away by his own points and rhetoric, but I do think that he often overstates it a bit when it comes to uh, Pope Francis and, and coloniality, or just to say, Pope Francis is maybe opening some very important doors to decolonizing the church, but he is not himself going to be the one to do it. <laughs> He's not going to decolonize the church. Well, fair. Okay. Helpful context for some of the ways that, you know, it's not quite perfect. Not, not a perfect project. Um, good to keep in mind, I guess. Yeah. Nevertheless, I mean, Leonardo Boff does have some interesting pieces uh, to add on this. He says, for example, we must realize that European Christianity is in its twilight years, its death throes. Once it was a spring of living water, and today it is a pond of lifeless, stagnant water. And I think that there's probably something to that that's true. Uh, European and Eurocentric Christianity is just not, I mean, demographically, it's not going to be the the shape of Christianity. It's already not by the numbers. Uh, yeah. Most Christians do not live in Europe or the U.S. anymore. And I think saying that it's in its death throes is exactly right. Like, that's the kind of uh, counter reaction against Pope Francis that you see is a lot of Catholics, you know, bishops and otherwise sort of maybe seeing the writing on the wall that their cultural supremacy is going away. They don't yeah. like that and they want to push up against that. I think that's a pretty good point. That's true. I mean, the surge of like right wing Catholics is definitely a reaction to a lot of that. Um, there's something that Boff says later in the book uh, that I think is kind of an interesting spin on that death throes kind of thing. Um, maybe less death throes, more sublimation. But uh, Boff says Christianity presents itself as a Western phenomenon and now must find itself within a new phase of humanity, the planetary phase. Only thus will it belong to all and be for all, which I think is um, I think it's a, a complicated move that he's making here. Uh, it presents itself as a Western phenomena, but and but now it's entering a new phase, which, OK, it's true because, uh, you know, the Pope's coming from a different part of the world and there's sort of this new like, you know, we're just talking about there's this sort of like uh, the, the numbers are elsewhere when it comes to uh, um, Catholicism and I guess Christianity probably as a whole uh the the last part is cool that like christianity might transcend like the the western the western i guess setting but uh that that seems to me like a a, a hope not a necessarily like a fact mm -hmm. yeah i mean you see that in for example like the statements that you get in some catholic circles in the global south where their theology is much closer to very traditionalist theologies in europe which far-right catholics identify and <laughs> glom onto and say they're not racist because look at this bishop that i like who is not white you know all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff is part of it for sure so it's not as automatic as like the demographic change doesn't simply change the the mindset and so on um which I think Leonardo Boff is also aware of and kind of acquainted with, you know, and has experience of like, he's very critical of uh, the kind of reactionary elements of Latin American Christianity as well, which he sees as kind of a, you know, colonized thing. It's all that kind of Franz Fanon stuff. You know, you, the, the colonized can inter internalize the, the mindset of the colonizer and kind of reproduce it and repeat it. And there's material incentives to do that. But I think the the most interesting thing is that note about the planetary phrase. I mean, or planetary phase. It just calls to mind that uh, Balasuria yeah. stuff that we were reading a while ago on planetary theology. So I think there's something to that that does feel kind of right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm here for it. It sounds great. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I think about <laughs> Balasuria all the time. Uh, Christianity that's built on solidarity rather than like um, a hard theological, I don't know, doctrine or something. It's great. <laughs> um cool man well i feel like we're time is ticking away here we still have so much to talk about uh do you want to say something about pope francis and liberation theology that seems like a, another another thing that you, you know about more than i do <laughs> sure yeah for sure uh yeah i mean the big question that people often have with the pope from latin america is is he a liberation theologian and uh, I wrote a great article for Sojourners a long time about it. So you should just read that and give me some more clicks. That'll be really <laughs> important for my brand. Uh, but uh, 
You can also just take it from a liberation theologian himself, Leonardo Boff, and the way that he parses it out, I think, is pretty clever. So he says, Father Bergoglio always supported this theology of the people, uh, and that specifically, theology of the people, is a form of theology that was developed in Argentina uniquely with the experience of Juan Perón and Peronism. It's a kind of, like, populist theology. It is progressive, but not... Uh, It doesn't use the same sources or kind of vocabulary as liberation theology. So it's a distinct thing, the theology of the people. So Boff goes on to say, without having to use the more common expression liberation theology, Pope Francis never departed from his basic insight and fundamental aim to make the faith an instrument for the liberation of the oppressed. Instead of doing a class analysis showing the origins of impoverishment and social oppression, Theology of the people prefers to analyze popular culture and its dynamism and contradictions, stressing the elements of participation and liberation that are present in it. The two tendencies complement each other in the service of a very important cause, the difficult service demanding sacrifice and sometimes even martyrdom of supporting the poor in their struggles and strengthening their desire for liberation. So a classic sort of boff move of reconciliation here. Uh, Boff is a liberation theologian. He does a lot of class analysis. He writes a lot about how class is very important as a starting point, but he recognizes too that uh, Pope Francis comes from a different kind of context. And instead of being like, we should choose one or the other, he sees them both as kind of of a piece in that struggle for liberation itself. Uh, And that kind of reminded me also of Balasiria, right? That Balasiria's conclusions about liberation theology is that it's great, but you shouldn't provincialize it or kind of get to get to be like liberation theology is the universal theology but on the contrary that like liberation theology might push us toward a more planetary theology and that would be the the ultimate goal of which liberation theology is one path so i guess i see uh boff doing something very similar there to say that pope francis is not a liberation theologian but he's you know moving along the same the same track cool a helpful explanation um, easing <laughs> that should ease the uh, the fears of the right wing. I'm sure uh, they will now just come <laughs> around to him. He's not a liberation theologian exactly, so that's great. When you think about Saint Francis, you're going to be thinking about ecology, right? There's all these great stories about Saint Francis and like um, and animals of all kinds. Uh, one time, Saint Francis convinced the mayor of a city that was not a CC. I don't think. That like people should make sure they feed the birds on Christmas Day so the birds even can eat and celebrate the birth of Jesus. And uh, there's all kind of, and there's other great stories about how he's you know singing with crickets and uh, I don't know. Um, he's talking to wolves. He's talking to wolves. He's psyched about his brother the moon and his. I'm sorry, his brother the sun and his sister the moon. <laughs> This great you got to get their pronouns right. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I really do. I wouldn't want to mess them up. Um, anyways, ecology uh, is a big deal in, when it comes to uh, the person of St. Francis and his sort of like life and witness. And in a like way, it has to be a big deal for this guy who's going to take Francis's name, <laughs> the Pope. So uh, there's a few pieces in here that um, Boff has about ecology and like maybe like what that might look like in terms of uh, – uh, Pope Francis. Um, so I'm going to read these pieces here that uh, maybe will uh, set the stage to talk about some of that. So Boff writes, the question is of caring for the life of the earth and guaranteeing the future of our civilization. For this, external ecology is not enough. We have to join it with internal ecology, and that is what France of Assisi did in a pragmatic way. So Boff starts setting up this distinction of internal ecology and external ecology. And uh, it's interesting, an interesting move. uh, And I mean, pretty cool, I guess. You know, there's like the ecology on the outside, like the relation between beings in terms of like uh, uh, natural processes and like rhythms and stuff. But then like there's the internal ecology about the ways that we actually fit into that uh, larger system of creation. and uh, that that's the that's what we need to, to harmonize those two things. Um, and then he says towards the end of the chapter, what do we want that Francis of Rome should take his inspiration from Francis of Assisi and be transformed through his humility, poverty and cheerfulness into a lover of Mother Earth and defender of all kinds of life, especially lives that are most threatened, the lives of the poor and those who suffer the most. So he's uh 
Boff is saying that, you know, this is what this is what a Pope Francis will have to do is kind of figure out this connection uh, between the internal and external ecology uh, and and figure out, like, what does it mean to like, you know, how do you how do you take all these like wild stories about animals and like uh, love for uh, the rest of creation? And how do you like turn it into a way of being like the Pope, <laughs> you know, like being the <laughs> like the the custodian of a giant um body like the catholic church like someone who does actually have a lot of power in the world like what what would you do and i mean uh, this is this is written before all of the papal encyclicals uh, about ecology but uh i don't know those seem like actually pretty strong answers and, and pr- pretty strong answers to to what boff is saying here um mm-hmm. yeah uh, a really interesting like the ecology stuff it, i mean if you had read it um if you had not known when the book was written and you read it now, <laughs> you'd be like, oh, well, Boff is saying this, of course, because uh, Francis is writing all of this stuff about ecology and and nearly degrowth and things like that. So it all fits together, right? It all clicks. Uh, but this is Boff's desire and he gets it for sure with Francis. Yeah, I mean, it is important to note that like Laudato to Sea hadn't come out when Boff wrote this book. It was still it wouldn't come out till 2015, Laudato to Sea. So definitely intuiting something there for sure. Um, also, uh, all right, I'm going to read you a quote here, Matt, and I'm going to ask you to talk about Felix Guattari. Oh, gosh. And uh, yeah, I know it's going to sound wild, but you're making me talk about all this Catholic stuff. So I'm going to make you talk about this. Uh, Pope Francis says, uh, or sorry, Leonardo Boff says, um, we do not know how to harmonize the ecologies in the plural, uh, the environment, the social, the mental, and the integral. And I think throughout the book, he's trying to kind of have a, a bigger understanding of you and what caring about ecology is or what it might mean. And uh, Leonardo Boff doesn't cite Felix Guattari here, but he does use a very Guattari term later that we'll talk about later. And Matt, I just think uh, you're the expert around here. Um, why why might there be some kind of Guattari vibe to this passage, for me at least? Why why my <laughs> Guattari alarms going off? Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> so Felix Guattari, a great French philosopher uh, who you might know him from writing a bunch of books with this guy named Gilles Deleuze. Uh, Guattari, he's the wild one, though, of the of the of the duo. <laughs> Um, so Guattari is, he, well, he wrote a few books by himself, the one that I think is probably important here is called three ecologies. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we got some various ecologies working here. The, the, the idea behind, um, Guattari and ecologies though, is that, uh, you know, we think of ecology as like, it's the natural world, right? This is like spiders and their webs and they're eating flies and whatever. But uh, Guattari thinks that ecology is bigger than that. It's about like the connection, you know, not just like, not just natural connections or, or something, but it also encompasses like social relationships, um, like the subjectivity of humans, as well as like environmental concerns and how these things are kind of all tied together. So uh, it has a lot to do with like, human perception and subjectivity, which is always kind of the locus of Felix Guattari. Um, anyways, so this idea of like that you're harmonizing them, that like these things are kind of clicking together. Uh, I, I think, I mean, for Guattari, it's never quite that simple um, because there's a lot of other, th- other things going on, but like, that's kind of <laughs> what's going on here a little bit, right? It's recognizing um, that uh, the the internal ecology of humans, the external ecology of the world, they're bound up together in these different ways. Um, so here we go. Felix Katari, he's in here. <laughs> he's in the mix. <laughs> That's right, listeners. You just got guitari by Matt. Uh, I think it's great. Um, and I mean, uh, I don't think it's too far off to draw the parallels. Like I said, Boff doesn't cite him here, but uh, it all makes sense what you're explaining. And I think... There is an influence of Guattari on a lot of Brazilian thought. He went to Brazil. Uh, he met uh, Lula and a bunch of other people even. And he had some extremely funny things to say about Christianity. I think, did we talk about it one time? Probably I think so. Did yeah. This podcast. He wasn't, he wasn't yeah. crazy about it. He, he wasn't. But then he met Lula and Lula was like, actually, Christianity is really weird. And Guattari was like, you might be right. So mm. you never know. You never do. Uh, Speaking of Guattari, there's another uh, Guattari reference here that I think is more direct. Um, so, Matt, maybe you can ask you to put your Guattari glasses back on. Oh, I'm, not, and, I'm uh, never taking them off. <laughs> uh, so a little bit later on, um, 
Leonardo Voss says, St. Francis spoke to the Cardinals and Bishop's president of the need to care and for a revolution of tenderness. This is a molecular revolution taking place. It can envelop the whole church and more and more people in society in order to make possible a huge and necessary change of civilization. The closeness of each to all, respect, shared restraint, and care for life that is threatened. And okay. the key term here is molecular revolution. What is going on, Matt? Yeah, it's such a funny phrase to see in this context. You, you never would expect it. So Felix Cotari wrote a book with Antonio Negri, um, R.I.P., uh, who recently passed away, uh, called Communists Like Us, New Lines of Alliance, New... Shoot, what's the subtitle? I got half of it, and that's as far as I'm going to get. Hot Folks, and fresh, new and great. Yeah, I'm. I'm. This is all coming right off the dome. So uh, forgive me for not remembering the subtitle of this book. <laughs> Anyways, they wrote this book, Communists Like Us. Uh, it's free on the internet. Go read it. Anyways, an idea that Guattari pushes out in this one is that um, this is again like this is like in the 70s and like kind of early 80s. So some some of the terminology that we would use today isn't quite there yet. Um, so Guattari is this like has this idea about this this new type of capitalism or like a mutation of capitalism called integrated world capitalism. That's like, it's global, it's neoliberal, it's like uh, digital, all these kinds of things. It's like, you know, transforming global economies into capitalist economies, all this kind of stuff. That's what Guattari thinks. And he's like, well, you know, you can't have like a, I don't know, Bolshevik revolution. Um, It's not going to work in the same way because of the globalness of capitalism, because of how things are interconnected, all these kinds of ways. Um, which is um, also kind of where Antonio Negri gets into the mix. Um, uh, Guattari, like I said, he's French, but uh, Negri is Italian, and they both are really like kind of um, pivotal thinkers in uh, the Italian autonomist movement, which is kind of this left communist tendency that's kind of like anarchism, but not quite. But anyways, that's too much. So anyways, uh, Guattari and Negri, they have this idea that they kind of collaborate on about molecular revolution. And it's just like the idea of, um, you know, like that there are so many identitarian causes within society that they need to be co-opted into not co-opted. They need to be like set against capitalism in ways that I think are probably really natural to them. So like, you know, the black power movement or whatever should be antagonistic to should be antagonistic to capitalism because uh, capitalism, you know, wants to exploit black people is like maybe part of it. And they should find common cause with people who are communists and they should find common cause with people who are feminists and all these kinds of things. Right. So it's this idea that there are all of these like constituent groups or I, I said the, the word identitarian and maybe that's too like flippant or I'm being like, I don't know, maybe that's not the right word exactly. But like the idea is that there are all of these different groups um, within capitalism and that they could be organized together against capitalism. Um, and that's that's the molecular revolution. It's all these different <laughs> little pieces coming together to like kind of push back against the the overwhelming uh, system of capitalism. The use in this conference context is, though, is, is really interesting. Uh, there's a molecular revolution taking place within the church and that maybe it can kind of like take over the rest of society. Uh, I, I don't know about that one, Dean. Uh, what do you think uh, on this take? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the revolution of tenderness idea is really interesting. I do think that it suffers from that typical Franciscan naivete, you know, like it's the kind of thing that St. Francis did literally believe that if he was, you know, living this life of poverty, and really committed to it and really being kind and tender to all creation that that itself would be transformative. And to be fair, like it was transformative in medieval society, uh, a whole religious order was yeah. birthed out of it. Um, so there's something to it. Like, I think that's you, it, it, there might be a tendency to like, or a temptation to read this as sort of liberal, like hopes and dreams or kind of idealism of like, Oh, for just nice to everybody, then everybody will be nice. I think there's something deeper to that. Like yeah. it's a whole pattern of life, you know, like um, a, a means of living together. That's really revolutionary. And I think that, like I said, that's still a bit of a naive take, but it's a, it's a good one. It's like a good naivete to have. It's a naivete that should maybe also inform all your other political organizing and strategy. I think that's how I feel. It is like, you know, Herbert McCabe has that bit about how the Sermon on the Mount makes you a good comrade. Cause you should be like, you know, nice to other people, but in a, a politically meaningful way. And St. Francis, I think, is doing something similar there. And uh, Boff is carrying that through with some different language. But I think there is 
there's something substantial there. If there is a kind of molecular revolution of tenderness, um, it does sort of spill itself out. And you see that even in those moments of like, when real mutual aid happens for a minute, people get a glimpse of another society. I think you got to do more than that. You got to build something to capture that energy, but getting the energy flowing is important too. Yeah, that's true. And especially when you kind of think of what that molecular revolution of ten the molecular revolution of tenderness might look like from like a, the Franciscan perspective, it is pretty radical, right? Like um, it's not just like tenderness towards other people, but towards creation too. It's, it's not just like mm-hmm. you're, you're letting the spider that you find inside your house outside your house, but it's like, you're trying to figure out a different way of living in, in the, the rhythm of nature, um, not emphasizing property but emphasizing a different way of life altogether right there's something like actually really radical about that um Mm -hmm. that you can't just write off yeah i think that is exactly right uh and i think that's also the vision that pope francis seems to have for the church and for society you know like you think of something like in fratelli tutti where he's talking about fraternity and what it means to really build solidarity and it all comes down to this culture of encounter or dialogue or synodality I think Pope Francis does have like a deep, genuine belief that if people do kind of have the courage to encounter each other, that something kind of mystical can happen in that space that wouldn't happen without it. And again, I also think that can be and it often is mobilized for kind of deep political aims or, you know, it's sort of like whatever kumbaya theology or something. And that is the <laughs> the dominant form of uh, progressive thinking, unfortunately, in the world. But I do think there is a deep truth to it as well. You see it in peace processes in the world. You see it even in revolutionary context and certainly in interpersonal life and so on. There, there's something there. I think it can't stop there. That's maybe the the big problem is sometimes people would just want to stop at the moment of encounter. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's there's maybe more questions that a good encounter can provoke you to ask, like what are the structures that actually enable encounter and what are the ones that prevent it and how do you kind of build those structures in a deeper way. So I think there's something there. I think so too. All right. So we're kind of at the end of the hour here. We've worked our way through the big themes of the book. Um, Boff thinks that Pope Francis will be a reformer. He'll kind of carry this Franciscan attitude towards ecology and, uh, and, and, but ecology, like in the big sense, the internal ecology, the external ecology, uh, towards a molecular revolution of tenderness. You got to love it. A great phrase. Um, <laughs> but now, Dean, we have to add, I, you have to answer like the final important question and what it is. What is your Pope name? When will you when will you tell us? Right. Well, uh, let's see. Um, totally off the dome uh, without being St. Francis to to Francis. Oh, uh, man, that'd be OK, though. Yeah, I mean, that would probably be it for me. I'd probably be Francis number two. But I feel like uh, there's got to be some really weird saints out there that I'm not thinking of. I'll definitely think of one later. Maybe I'll come back next week. But uh, right away, just for pure iconography's sake, uh, it'd be great to break people's brains by being Pope Christopher because St. Christopher... Oh, he's the werewolf guy, right? Depicted. Exactly. He's the dog man. I'd love to be the dog pope. Uh, also there's like legitimate question as to whether or not he was real or ever existed. And I think that is great. You should just be like, yeah, I'm the fake saint with a dog head. And that's, that's me as a pope. Now, why is he, a do- does he have a dog head? I can't remember. I just remember that he looks like a werewolf and that's all I can get to. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stuff like there's, uh, some stuff you'd probably just guess like, uh, some conflations of, uh, his iconography with like Anubis imagery in Egypt there's some narratives around him that I can't really remember, uh, but he's also often like one of the big St. Christopher stories is that he <laughs> there's a great story where he's like the way he's converted to Christianity is he wants to find the toughest guy, the strongest guy. <laughs> and uh, he goes out, he finds a strong king and he's like, wow, this king's really strong. I'm going to serve that guy. And then he finds out that the king's afraid of the devil. And he's like, "Whoa, the devil sounds really strong. I'm going to follow the devil. So he does. And then he finds out that the devil is afraid of God and Jesus Christ. So he becomes a Christian because he's like, (laughs) I got to follow the strongest guy. Uh, So there's a kind of like story of Christopher being, you know, like kind of a hound of of God, like always chasing Uh, after him. So there's lots of lots of images there. But 
yeah, that's the other great part is I would be the Pope who's just in the gym all the time getting swole. Uh, it'd be the the one time I ever cared about <laughs> physical fitness <laughs> be my my papal conversion. Man, um, that's a really interesting story. Uh, I kind of wish it had more to do with him actually being a dog. Uh, to, so he could be the, <laughs> the one and only cryptid saint, but um, maybe not. <laughs> we should look up more cryptid saints guarantee there's a bunch of them they're they're probably all kind of cryptid if you think about it you know they're doing miraculous things they're doing i guess that's all they're doing really is miraculous things <laughs> <laughs> having great moral teaching i don't know that's boring i just give me the miraculous things they're spooky. I mean, the the cryptid saint barrier is pretty porous, right? Like some of them are flying around in the lap in the rafters. They're bilocating. They're bleeding randomly. They're saints are basically cryptids. You heard it here folks, first, folks. Saints are basically cryptids. Thanks for listening to Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Uh, you can join up now, get in, get in the Magnificast Discord, and you can uh, join us for a year of reading the Bible, <laughs> which is surprisingly popular for some reason. Um, man, I'm so psyched that so many people have chosen to do this with us. Um, the Discord's been really fun. Lots of great theories. Like, okay, lately, sorry, the, the theories are great. The uh, The input from people who know more than me is also great. What I really appreciated lately, though, is that uh, we're in Leviticus and uh, we're all just commiserating about how <laughs> kind of boring it is. <laughs> so anyways, we're going to get past Leviticus sooner or later. Um, but uh, right now we're learning about, you know, uh, priestly vestments, how you make an offering to God, uh, how much of the fat you're going to burn off the kidneys of a boar or uh, sorry, of a cow. I don't know. Um, it's all of it, by the way. So anyways, uh, join us and uh, <laughs> get to know how to burn animals, um, a great part of the Bible. Dean, what's been your favorite part so far? Sorry, this is this is not Man. the outro is turning into a extended commercial for our uh, Patreon <laughs> reading the Bible, but we have to do it. That's right. Uh, you know what? There's even I'll even add something to the mix. You made it this far into the podcast. There's a great passage about postmodernism in this Leonardo Boff book that we didn't even talk about. So maybe we'll oh, put that no. in the Discord chat. OK, yeah, that's um, fine. But uh, my favorite part of the Bible so far actually was rereading the plague narrative. It was really fun. It made me want to watch Prince of Egypt again. I was like, wow, all this happens in the span of like two weeks. There's a lot going on here. Um, It was great. Love rereading all that stuff. Yeah, it was really fun. Um, I did watch the Noah movie that came out not too long ago after we had read the Noah story. And man, oh, nice. The movie is it's great. I love it. The, it's a Darren it Aronofsky great. one, man. It's a uh, it's a great movie. All kinds of wild stuff going on in that one. Oh, that reminds me. Okay, here's a great Patreon pitch. Uh, I don't know why this podcast is just going completely off the rails, but I guess because uh, Matt and I didn't get to talk to each other that much. So here we are. Um, <laughs> so Emily, my wife, we were talking about reading the Bible and how funny it is to read it as an adult and rethink whatever being an evangelical. And she brought up the movie Expelled by Ben Stein. Huh. Uh, did you ever watch that movie, Matt? I don't think so. Well, uh, it came out when we were probably in high school or thereabouts. And uh, it's a Ben Stein movie. It's him not talking about dry eyes, but talking about evolution. And oh, he's a young Earth creationist. He goes, yeah. It's so he goes to all to these. Uh, yeah, he finds all these scientists who were expelled. They're pushed out of their jobs or the academy because of the bigotry of big science and uh emily was like you should really do a sort of where are they now these uh expelled <laughs> young earth creationists so maybe we'll do that for the patreon at one point when we have time i think oh it's a God. great idea and uh she is really tapping into some weird parts of our evangelical past that's such a good idea yeah i imagine they're all teaching at like uh you know bob jones university or whatever <laughs> so there you go donate to the patreon and you can get this and other great content at some point when we do it All right. Our intro music is by Mario Armstrong. Our outro music is by The Logical Spoon. We'll see you next time. (laughs) Bye. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. 
Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church We'll meet down by the riverside There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no dam between us and our Lord Jackson, you keep your hoods up, you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late. In Jackson, you keep your hoods up, where you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early, at least I would have.